You'll have to forgive me in this video. I am dealing with a bit of a chest cold, but I will try to get across uh, without too much raspiness. So I wanted to talk a little bit about neutral mutations and kind of the controversy around them and, and, and what we're talking about here so that we're clear. The first thing that we need to look at is what are we talking about? Neutral to what? Meaning that a it is neutral to selection or neutral to fitness. So let's distinguish between those. So neutral to fitness means that it is truly neutral. Um, it has no effect on the functionality uh, or the fitness of the organism. Now this is a debated subject. Um, no one really knows if there are any truly neutral um, uh, mutations because it's basically impossible to test for that. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about why nobody really thinks that there are, or if there are, there are hardly any. But basically, going back to our example that we used earlier, um, it's a genetic change that happens in something that's already not functional. So here's an example. Jack here in this generation, he was the survivor. Uh, his code had this hack. Hack is meaningless, uh, that spelling of it in English. Um, and then it changed in his child, Dean. Dean got one neutral mutation, neutral change, because hack became hab. So that didn't have any effect on the functionality. Now, the question that they have with this is, but maybe hab is slightly more likely to produce another word or something like that. And again, that is something that is debatable, but it's sort of irrelevant because even if it does make some tiny difference, it would be a very, very small difference. Whereas, you know, a beneficial change or something else, you know, or, or, or a harmful change, those can make bigger differences within the genome than really tiny, essentially neutral mutations. Um, so, and, and also the assumption is that a change from hack to hab would more likely be deleterious or harmful. And we'll, we'll look at some of the research about that later. Um, but really what most of the research that, that I look at when you're talking about a neutral mutation, something that we can detect, is if it is neutral to selection. In other words, is this something that is selected away or not? So in this case, you know, this thing, uh, there actually are two neutral mutations. One of them was a neutral beneficial mutation because it wasn't selected away. Okay, um, this guy got selected away, um, but this guy didn't. So these changes were, you know, not selected. So these are both considered neutral mutations to selection because selection didn't touch them. Um, moving down the chain again, you can see there were three harmful changes that were not selected away because only Tom was selected away. Dick was able to actually, you know, uh, reproduce and therefore um, his these these um, changes were were not affected by selection. So you have to clarify if you're ever talking about it whether you're talking about something that is neutral to selection or neutral to fitness. Now one other point with this is uh, neutral to selection does not mean that it's neutral, entirely neutral. That's why what you'll find in most of the academic research literature is that they will call it effectively neutral or nearly neutral. So what they're saying here is that these are changes that, yeah, they didn't kill the organism. They didn't result in ta or in Dick dying. You know, he did survive, but they were still bad. They were still harmful. They just weren't so harmful that they killed him. So they consider it effectively neutral or nearly neutral because it didn't kill Dick and he was able to pass on those uh, harmful you know, changes, those reductions in information from the previous generation, he was able to pass those on. So that is the difference between the two. Now, let's take a look here at how this all plays into some of the actual research that's been done. So they had the question of, okay, well, how often do, you know, if, if you have a change, what is the probability that it is going to be negative or positive? So let's imagine right here, this is just a, a bell curve, okay? So, and instead of doing people, just change that out and put the word um, 
mutation or most changes. So some changes, most changes, or all. So if, if mutations were equally distributed, they'd look like this. Zero in the middle would be a... Um, it means that these are the ones that are neutral. So most of them would pile up around the neutral, which is zero. If they're to the right, that means that they're really uh, good mutations, that they're really going to lead toward a lot of survival. And if they're to the left, they're the negative values, which means that they are closer to death. So imagine there's a zero here, there's a one over here, and there, or a negative one over here, and then a one over here. So if you had a score of one, um, then that would mean that it's a, you know, it's a really good mutation. If it was a negative one, that means you're going to die. Okay. It's like the worst mutation. There's no chance you're going to make it. Um, but most of them fall kind of in the middle. Now, now this is a bell curve. This isn't the actual distribution. I'm just showing what this looks like, but this, you could imagine that if they were equally distributed between bad and good mutations, this is what the curve would look like. Um, so what happened was, uh, Kimura in the 1960s, came up with this theory of neutral mutation where he said, okay, there's a bunch of them. You can see this gray box here. These are the gray ones. These are the ones that, uh, you know, there's basically three points. There's the, there's the bad ones. There's a few of the good ones. You'll notice very, no one predicts that there's a lot of beneficial mutations. The vast majority are going to be bad, but their thing is, okay, that's fine. They're bad. They'll be selected away, which is actually incorrect because they can still get through selection, um, as we pointed out. But we'll talk about that in a second. So, and then there's the neutral ones that basically don't really affect anything anyway, right? And so that's why they have the score of zero, negative one, and that. So that's what he thought the distribution looked like. One of his students in the 70s helped, uh, worked with him and basically helped him realize that that's actually a bad distribution because these neutral mutations actually form kind of like a bell curve, or they don't form a bell curve. They actually form, as you can see, an exponential distribution, meaning none of them are actually approaching or actually hitting zero. They just approach it, right? And these ones in the middle are effectively neutral, okay? Meaning that they are they're not selected. They are neutral to selection. These ones will get selected away because they'll kill the organism. These ones that are really, really good, they'll make sure that the, that one survives so they spread throughout a population. But these ones in the middle are very, very subtle. And so they get passed through to each generation. They don't get selected away. Selection doesn't have any real power over them. So this is another... Uh, actually, I'll, I'll show the representation of... Um, of his actual research from the 1970s is 1979, where uh, Kimura actually puts together his model based on, you know, Ota's feedback, all that stuff, right? So he kind of combines everything and he comes up with this mathematical model to predict how likely, uh, you know, what the distribution is of good versus bad mutations. Um, and what he comes up with here is this graph. Now, I want you to take a look at this graph. These are negative numbers at the bottom. So what he's done is he's flipped the graph where, you know, normally the negatives are on the left-hand side of the zero, but he put them on the right-hand side. So it's just, it's just flipped. But you'll notice, again, it's an exponential distribution with none of them actually touching uh, the neutral point um, because these are effectively neutral mutations. And then he creates sort of this zone here. Now I'm going to show, this is a simplified version of it, where, but you'll notice this one's flipped because it does have the negative values, again, the bad mutations over here. There's a zone what we'll call kind of like the no selection zone. In other words, if something's way over here, it's like, okay, it's really harmful, it's going to kill you, and you're not going to survive to reproduce, so that's gone. So natural selection will take care of those. But eventually, as things get closer to neutral, they just don't really affect you that much, so you still most likely will survive to reproduce. But they are still g degenerating your, your gene code, uh, your, your genetics compared to the last generation, just like we saw here with... Uh, uh, with Dean here, with his code, you know, yeah, Dick survived because Tom had a really crappy code, but Dick's code was still less, wasn't as good as Dean's. And if that pattern continues over time, it's fallen apart. So again, this is what his curve is showing. It's showing that there is an area that is effectively neutral, meaning neutral to selection, but still deleterious. Okay. So 
here's where we have the competing models of molecular evolution. And this is his big thing, the neutral theory, which basically is what everyone says. Now, now notice these ratios. The beneficials are tiny. Nobody thinks there's a lot of beneficial mutations. They're extremely rare. If you randomly scramble letters over and over in a big word, the likeliness of you getting an actual functional code out of it, a code that makes a word, is very, very low. So, um, again, all of these neutral, again, these aren't totally neutral. These are effectively neutral, meaning they're not being selected away. But what you find is, according to Kimura's graph, which we can look at, the majority of them still, all of these effectively neutral ones, the frequency of them, the distribution is really high. In other words, these are slightly deleterious, slightly harmful mutations that are being missed by selection. They are breaking down the functional information in the DNA just like we showed in our example here. So, um, the selectionist model is basically out of vogue. Like, that's that's old school, and it wouldn't have worked either. So the neutral model is a problem because, as you can see, 99% of the changes are detrimental. That's not good if there's only a small percentage of these near-neutral mutations that are actually... Uh, beneficial. And as I'm, I'm saying, I'm not making up that the majority of these purple ones are actually uh, negative because uh, in Kimura's graph, he even shows it that they are, the majority are like that. So um, now this is, again, this is not a crazy theory that I have. This is already well supported um, by other, you know, most of the um, academic literature um, on these del slightly deleterious mutations is it, it all kind of says the same thing. They're like, yeah, this is a, you know, they're all... They, now, here's what happens. They don't agree with my conclusions. That's true. Because what they say... But they don't disagree with the problem that I'm pointing out. They all say, yes, they just have different... And, and they don't agree. They, a lot of them have different ideas about how this problem can be solved. It's, you know, well, well sexual combination will fix it or... Uh, epistasis, uh, synergistic epistasis will fix it. But my point is not to, I, I, I'm, I'm open to those. I actually haven't, I need to look more into some of their solutions that they pose, but I want to acknowledge that this is a problem and it's a problem that is a total, flies in the face of everything you're taught in school. So, um, yeah, Kashan, uh, Kon Kondrashov, um, he basically pointed out this whole problem. He wrote an entire book uh, that's now kind of like an e-textbook, really long, not really widely attacked as bullcrap. Uh, it is basically all the stuff we're talking about, the impact of these deleterious mutations building up over time, and that our genome, just like I pointed out in the example, is falling apart. He's on board with that. Um, so is A.T. Bernards, who says, in the time, uh, in the time evolution of uh, in the time evolution of finite populations, the accumulation of harmful mutations in further generations might lead to a temporal decay in the mean fitness of the whole population after sufficient time would reduce the population size and so lead to extinction. That's literally what I just demonstrated in this example. Okay. Now, he says that there is a solution to it, which he goes into, um, that there may be something that we can, we can do it. I, again, I'm more than happy to hear what his explanation is. You can break it down for me and show why it, it totally counters this. But again, he acknowledges the problem. So does uh, uh, Kondrashov, and so does uh, Erie Walker, who talks about the problems with these super high deleterious gene, uh, rates that are just being passed on from generation to generation. Um, so does Michael Lynch, uh, who's one of the leading researchers in this field uh, when it comes to it. He basically says in this uh, particular um, research article that humans are screwed. <laughs> we're, we're falling apart genetically. And yeah, he says it's basically caused because we're not do having enough selection. But as Kashandrov points out, that actually isn't the case. Even if you do have selection, it doesn't work. Um, and, and, and again, there's, I'm more than happy to discuss the solutions that are, that these people offer or say why they don't arrive at the same conclusion as me, but they all acknowledge the same problem. Okay. 
And what I'm saying is, is if that problem exists, there is legitimate reason to be skeptical about the neo-Darwinian model of evolution, which I was taught in school that it is random mutations plus natural selection. What I have found in all of this research literature is that that's not true. We've discovered more about the genome, and basically what we found is that the genome goes down, not up, in functionality. That we can't really find hardly anything um, of large increases in information. We will find things that break down that actually end up being beneficial, uh, such as what happens with antibiotic resistance and in, in other uh, experiments that they've done. Not saying that new beneficial mutations cannot happen. Uh, they just are exceedingly rare, and that is in a massive problem because the ratios matter. Um, because evolution or uh, selection cannot select away um, all of the bad mutations. They can only select away um, certain organisms that aren't good. But if the entire fitness of a group has gone down from one generation to the next because of uh, changes in their genetic code, then that's the new baseline, okay, um, that they have to deal with. So that is kind of a breakdown of how neutral mutations play into this and why Kimura's discoveries, the discoveries of Michael Lynch and Ota and a bunch of other people have kind of led to this conclusion that now people like um, uh, Kondrashov is you know, basically saying, hey guys, this is what's actually going on. Um, and so they all acknowledge the problem. It's just a matter of what the solution is. So anyway, that is, uh, that's it. Hey, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like and hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching.